You know, one of the intense pleasures of travel and one of the delights of ethnographic research is the opportunity to live amongst those who have not forgotten the old ways, who still feel their past in the wind, touch it in stones polished by rain, uh, taste it in the bitter leaves of plants. Just to know that jaguar shamans still journey beyond the Milky Way or the, the myths of the Inuit elders still resonate with meaning or that in the Himalaya, the Buddhists still pursue the breath of the Dharma is to really remember the central revelation of anthropology and that is the idea that the world in which we live in does not exist in some absolute sense but is just one model of reality, the consequence of one particular set of adaptive choices that our lineage made, albeit successfully, many generations ago. And of course, we all share the same adaptive imperatives. We're all born, we all bring our children to the world, we go through initiation rites, we have to deal with the inex inexorable separation of death. So it shouldn't surprise us that we all sing, we all dance, we all have art. But what's interesting is the unique cadence of the song, the rhythm of the dance in every culture. And whether it is the, the Penan in the forests of Borneo, or the voodoo acolytes in Haiti, or the warriors in the Kaisu Desert of northern Kenya, the Curandero in the mountains of the Andes, or a caravansary in the middle of the Sahara. This is incidentally the fellow that I traveled into the desert with a month ago. Or indeed a yak herder in the slopes of Chomalungma, Everest, the goddess mother of the world. All of these peoples teach us that there are other ways of being, other ways of thinking, other ways of orienting yourself in the earth. And this is an idea that if you think about it, can only fill you with hope. Now together, the myriad cultures of the world make up a, a web of spiritual life and cultural life that envelops the planet and is as important to the well-being of the planet as indeed is the biological web of life that you know as a biosphere. And you might think of this cultural web of life as being an ethnosphere, and you might define the ethnosphere as being the sum total of all thoughts and dreams, myths, ideas, inspirations, intuitions brought into being by the human, human imagination since the dawn of consciousness. The ethnosphere is humanity's great legacy. It's a symbol of all that we are and all that we can be as an astonishingly inquisitive species. And just as the biosphere is being severely eroded, so too is the ethnosphere, and if anything, at a far greater rate. No biologist, for example, would dare suggest that 50% of all species are morbid or on the brink of extinction because it simply is not true. And yet that, the most apocalyptic scenario in the realm of biological diversity, scarcely approaches what we know to be the most optimistic scenario in the realm of cultural diversity. And the great indicator of that, of course, is language loss. When each of you in this room were born, there are 6,000 languages spoken on the planet. Now, a language is not just a body of vocabulary or a set of grammatical rules. A language is a flash of the human spirit. It's a vehicle through which the soul of each particular culture comes into the material world. Every language is an old growth forest of the mind, a, a watershed of thought, an ecosystem of spiritual possibilities. And of those 6,000 languages, as we sit here today in Monterey, fully half are no longer being whispered into the ears of children. They're no longer being taught to babies, which means effectively, unless something changes, they're already dead. What could be more lonely than to be enveloped in silence, to be the last of your people to speak your language, to have no way to pass on the wisdom of the ancestors or anticipate the promise of the children. And yet that dreadful fate is indeed the plight of somebody somewhere on earth roughly every two weeks, because every two weeks some elder dies and carries with them into the grave the last syllables of an ancient tongue. And I know there's some of you who say, well, wouldn't it be better, wouldn't the world be a better place if we all just spoke one language? And I say, great, let's make that language Yorba. Let's make it Cantonese. Let's make it Kogi. And you'll suddenly discover what it would be like to be unable to speak your own language. And so what I'd like to do with you today is sort of take you on a journey through the ethnosphere, a brief journey through the ethnosphere, to try to begin to give you a sense of what, in fact, is being lost. Now, there are many of us who sort of forget that when I say different ways of being, I really do mean different ways of being. Take, for example, this child of the Barasana, the Northwest Amazon, a people of the Anaconda who believe that mythologically they came up the Milk River from the east in the belly of sacred snakes. 
Now this is a people who cognitively do not distinguish the color blue from the color green because the canopy of the heavens is equated to the canopy of the forest upon which the people depend.